When the east wind blows up Helford River, small waves beat angrily on the sandy shores. The gulls wheel and cry above the foam, their grey feathers glistening with salt spray. Once the river belonged to the gulls, the curlew and redshank, guillemot and puffin. Once, on a map of Cornwall faded and yellow, someone scratched the name of a narrow inlet, its short twisting course running westward into the valley. Frenchman's Creek. Look now. A figure stands by the river in the moonlight, the cold light glinting on his buckled shoes and the cutlass in his hands. A woman stands by his side, a cloak round her shoulders, her dark ringlets drawn back behind her ears. A forgotten century peers out of dust and cobwebs. Frenchman's Creek by Daphne du Maurier Dramatised in six parts by Micheline Wando With Lorna Heilbronn as Donna St. Colin Struan Roger as Jean Michael Tudor Barnes as William Michael Cochran as Harry and Christopher Godwin as Rockingham Part 1 London to Cornwall Dressed. Dressed, Harry? What for? The play. We're going to the play. Oh, Lord, must we? We always go to the play on Friday. Rockingham will be there. I say, those rubies look beautiful on you. Please, Harry. Oh, you look good enough to eat. Mm. Please, you'll spoil my dress. Oh, can't you keep the dogs quiet, Harry? Hey, hey, Duke, D Duchess, here, here, have some chocolate. They will leave marks everywhere. Oh, I don't care. At least they love me. Oh, damn it, Donna. Don't let's go to the play. Hang Rockingham, hang the world. Why the devil don't we stay at home, eh? No, no, if we are due to go to the play, we must go. Oh, very well. I wish you'd make up your mind. Come along, Duke. And you, Duchess, come on. Come on, here, boy. Here, 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 boy. Take the business. Here, there we are. <laughs> My dear, you look absolutely divine. And you, Rockingham, look absolutely drunk. <laughs> no more than your husband. May I sit next to you at dinner? Can I stop you? Ah, the only wife amongst a crowd of mistresses. You're honoured to sit cheek by jowl with the ladies of the town at the Swan. Mm, no, you cannot stop me. <laughs> I can stop you putting your hand on my knee. <laughs> Remove it, please. You like it? I shall tell Harry. <laughs> I'll tell him myself. I say, I say, old boy. Rocky, my friend. Your wife has a very fine knee, old fellow. <laughs> Aren't you angry, Harry? Rocky, you are very amusing. Oh, really? Have you told Harry about our little prank, my dear Donna? What? Uh, what prank? Hampton Court. Rockingham. <laughs> Last week when you were indisposed, Harry... Drunk, Rockingham. We rode to Hampton Court by moonlight. Donna dressed up in a pair of my breeches. We played at footpads, didn't we, Donna? We halted a carriage and forced an old woman to step down on the highway. Your young wife called out a hundred guineas or your honour. And the Countess, poor wretch, 60 if she were a day, gave us her sovereigns, terrified that this young rip from the town might throw her down into the ditch. Don't worry, Harry. I handed her back the purse and we rode back to town. <laughs> what on earth possessed you to dress up in Rockingham's breeches? Ah. Was there a masquerade? I mean, why didn't you take me? <laughs> a prank. It was a prank I played out of boredom. She made a delightful young highwayman. Oh, I don't understand either. I mean, <laughs> come on, I'm hungry. After you, Lady St. Colum. Thank you. 
Oh. Are you tired, Donna? I am tired, Harry. I'm very bored. I'll soon stop you being bored, my darling. Come here. Please, Harry. Oh, come on, Donna. No, I want to talk to you. Oh, very well then. But hurry up, you know I hate talking. I've had a most unpleasant evening. Huh? I hated the stupid play. I hated the silly audience shouting and throwing orange peel onto the stage. I hated... Oh, very well, my love. We shan't go to the play next week. Harry, why did you marry me? What on earth are you talking about? <sighs> Here I am with two children and next month I will be 30. Well, I don't mind that. I hate myself. Well, you are not to blame. Nor our senseless life, nor the foolish escapades, nor our friends. It's my fault. No. I want excitement and love and danger. And here I am, shut up in a musty house with stinking gutters outside in noisy, intolerable London. Well, why didn't you say? We'll, 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 we'll go to Hampshire. Yeah, yeah. We'll, we'll pack up and go to Hampshire. There. Now. May we go to bed? I want to smell the sea. Oh. I want to breathe. I want to go to Cornwall, to Navron. Well, very well. We'll go to Navron. I'll say word that the house is to be open. The servant's ready now. Donna, my love. I am at some kind of crisis in my life, Harry. I must go through it alone. Without you. But, damn it, Donna, you can't leave me. I must. If but what have I done? What have I said? I can't explain. Well, why don't you want me to come with you? I must be alone. Otherwise, I shall drive us both mad. Oh, God, I don't understand. Do you remember my father's aviary in Hampshire? One day, I set a linnet free, and it flew straight out of my hands towards the sun. Well, what of it? I feel like that. Like the linnet before it flew. Oh, I really can't follow you, my dear. No, I don't expect you can. <laughs> you look so sad in that white nightshirt, Harry. You poor dear. <laughs> Go to bed now. Oh, hell and damnation, Donna. Why must you be so confounded tricky? Apple blossom and gorse and the smell of moss from the moor. No more stupid pranks at Hampton Court. We'll dip our hands in the sea and not mind being soaked with the spray. No more pretense. Seabirds will scream at us, herons and curlews and gulls. Three hundred miles away from the smells in the Haymarket, and Rockingham's odious smile and Harry's yawn and his blue reproachful eyes. Apple blossom and gorse. No more boredom, no more stupidity, no more pretense. Just apple blossom and gorse and the sea. Not long now, Henrietta. Where are we going, Mama? We are going home, darling. But where? Why must we drive? It will be a new home, a much nicer home. You'll be able to run in the woods and dirty your clothes, and Prue will not scold you because it doesn't matter. But I don't want to dirty my clothes. I want to go home. Do you think they will have aired the house, my lady? I don't know, Prue. I suppose we'll have damp beds and closed shutters. But there will be apple blossom and gorse and the smell of moss from the moors and the sea. We'll dip our hands in the water and become soaked with the spray. Fishes will jump out of the water and seabirds will scream at us. <laughs> Are there gardens at Navron, madam? I suppose so. I only visited it once, just after we were married. I think there were trees and a river and great windows that peered from a long room. I can't remember any more. Just one endless business of sofas and sickness and smelling bottles. Mama! Mama! I'm hungry! We will stop and eat. Crew, we'll spread the rugs beneath the hedge and have a picnic. Shall we, children? Yes. Yeah. But my lady, the ground may be damp. Nonsense, Prue. We're hungry. Well, how shall I bathe the children's hands and faces? Never mind that today. I have some ale in the basket, Henrietta. Can I have some ale, Mama? Yes, and so shall James. We shall have a picnic. Right. Driver, stop the coach. This room smells like a tomb. 
I don't think it has been aired for a long time, my lady. There is dust everywhere. As your ladyship never came to Navron, it scarcely seemed worth my while to see that the rooms were clean. The idle mistress makes the idle servant. I did not say so, my lady. No, you did not. Please see that every room in the house is swept and dusted, the silver cleaned and flowers placed in every room, just as though the mistress of the house has been in residence here for many years. It will be my personal pleasure, my lady. I do hope you are not laughing at me, William. No, my lady. The gardeners have done their work at least. The grass is fresh trimmed and all the hedges clipped. And there, there is the river, shining and soundless, the sun dappling green and gold. William, is there a boat? Uh, well, my lady, the spring tides are due. Well, we shall see. I don't remember you, William. You were not here when we came before. Uh, no, my lady. I remember an old man. He had rheumatism and could hardly walk. Where is he now? In his grave, my lady. I see. And you replaced him? Yes, my lady. You have a strange accent. Uh, I will try to speak clearly, my lady. Oh, I can understand it well enough. Sir Harry and I thought that Navram was fully staffed. Well, it seemed to me, my lady, possibly wrongly, that one idle servant was sufficient. For the past year, I have lived here entirely alone. I could dismiss you for that. Yes, my lady. I might do so in the morning. Yes, my lady. But supposing I do not dismiss you, William, what then? I will serve you faithfully, my lady. How can I be sure of that? I have always served faithfully the people I love and respect, my lady. Now you are laughing at me. Still, you have spirit. I think you do too, my lady. Tomorrow I want fresh flowers everywhere and all the windows open wide. Very well, my lady. Tonight I shall eat late. I shall sit alone at the head of this long table with candles everywhere. I have a fancy for grapes, black and succulent with the bloom on them, all dusty. Yes, my lady. I will cut you a bunch with a pair of silver scissors. How quiet it is. A full moon. The smell of lilac. Henrietta looked like a waxen doll with her curls falling about her face, her mouth slightly pouted. James just looked chubby and truculent in his sleep, like a little pug dog. Such pretty children. <sighs> what on earth? That's not lilac. It's harsh. It stings. It... Good Lord. Tobacco. A jar of tobacco. Strong, freshly cut. William? Surely not. Sleeping in my bed, smoking, looking at my portrait. And a book of French poetry. Ronsard. J.B.A. Finisterre. A tiny drawing of a gull. Well, well, well. Lord Godolphin is here to see you, my lady. Who? Lord Godolphin, your neighbour. Um, there is a piece of honeysuckle behind your ear, my lady. Oh, damn. Henrietta, run along and find James. William will take you. Uh, here he is. This way, Henrietta. Come on. Good afternoon, Lady St. Colin. You must excuse me, Lord Godolphin. I have been playing with the children. I am enchanted to see you, of course. I heard you were in residence, and I thought it my duty to pay my respects. My wife would have accompanied me, but she does not enjoy very good health at the moment. 
She is... Uh... <clears throat> I quite understand. We hope for an heir. Of course. And when is Harry coming? I knew him very well when he lived here as a boy, you know. Indeed. I'm sorry to say Harry will not be coming. That is a pity. I was hoping he might assist us. You have heard of our troubles, no doubt? Troubles? No. Oh, well, perhaps you are too remote here. We have been vexed and harried almost to our wit's end with acts of piracy. How intriguing. Goods of considerable value have been lost along the coast. My neighbour, Lord Penrose, was robbed only last week. How distressing. It is more than distressing. It is a positive outrage. This damned Frenchman is like the plague. Frenchman? Uh, yes. This fellow's a low, sneaking foreigner who knows our coast like the back of his hand and slips away before we can lay our hands on him. His craft is like quicksilver. He creeps into our harbours at night, lands silently, like the stealthy rat he is, seizes our goods and is away on the morning tide while our fellows are rubbing the sleep out of their eyes. In fact, he is too clever for you. <laughs> Yes, madam, if you like to put it that way. We landowners will have to band ourselves together and deal with the menace. Is there anything I can do to help? <laughs> My dear lady, <laughs> there's nothing you can do. Except to ask your husband to come down and rally round his friends so that we can fight this damned Frenchman. I'm afraid Harry would never catch him. He is far too lazy. Perhaps you do not realise how serious the matter is. Our women folk sleep in terror of their lives. <coughs> and not only their lives. Is he that sort of pirate? This fellow is a Frenchman. It is only a question of time before something dastardly occurs. Oh, quite. Surely it must be possible to lay some trap for this foreigner. A ship is not a phantom thing. It depends on wind and tides. Men are not soundless. Their feet must echo on the keys. Their voices must fall in the air. This is not a matter for a lady to worry about. I suppose not. <sighs> well, I, uh, I must go now. When you next send messages to your husband, I trust you will give him some account of our troubles? Yes, of course. William! There's no need to show me out, your ladyship. Oh, very well. Good day, Lord Godolphin. I shall call upon your wife. Uh, good day, Lady St. Column. William, in future I will not be at home to call us. I will be out walking or asleep, ill or mad even, confined to my room in chains. I have come to Navron to avoid people, William. Yes, my lady. It shall not occur again. You shall enjoy your solitude and make good your escape. Escape? Yes, my lady. I had gathered that you are a fugitive from your London self, and Navron is your sanctuary. You have uncanny intuition, William. Many of my ideas and much of my philosophy are borrowed from my former master. I have made a practice of observing people, even as he does, and I rather think that he would term your ladyship's arrival here as an escape. Why did you leave your master, William? At the moment, my lady, my services are of little use to him. We decided I would do better elsewhere. So you came to Navron? Yes, my lady. Do you like poetry, William? <laughs> you must have gathered I am not a reader, my lady. The books here are coated with dust. Uh, tomorrow I will take them all down and dust them. You have no hobby, then? I have quite a fine collection of moths, my lady. The woods round Navron are excellent for the moths. So Navron is an escape for you, too? Possibly, my lady. And your former master, what does he do with himself? He travels, my lady. Then he also, William, is a fugitive. Indeed. I may say his life is one continual escape. How pleasant for him. The rest of us can only run away from time to time. And however much we pretend to be free, we know it is only for a little while. Just so, my lady. I should like to meet your master, William. I think you would have much in common, my lady. Perhaps.
Perhaps I will modify my command about visitors, William. Should your former master call, I will not feign madness or illness or any other disease. I will receive him. Very good, my lady. And now I have a great desire to walk along the river. There is the river, wide and shining as it meets the sea. The sea is still calm. In the distance, sea and sky meet at the horizon. A smudge, the white sails of a ship. No breath of wind upon the water. The ship hangs between sea and sky like a painted toy. A high poop deck and curious raking masts. A crowd of gulls clusters round the ship, wheeling and crying and diving to the water. Here comes the breeze. The waves ruffle out across the sea. And now the sails catch the breeze and fill, bellowing in the wind, white, lovely and free. The gulls rise in a mass, wheeling above the mast, and the setting sun catches the painted ship in a gleam of gold. Oh... I shall always remember this. Dear Harry, one Godolphin called upon me. I found him ill-favoured and pompous with a growth on the end of his nose. His wife is expecting a baby, at which I express sympathy. He was in a great fuss about a pirate, a Frenchman, who comes by night and robs his house. I propose setting forth myself with a cutlass between my teeth. When I have entrapped the rogue, who according to Godolphin is a very fierce fellow indeed, a slayer of men and a ravisher of women, I will bind him with strong cords and send him to you as a present. Oh dear. What's that? William. Meeting a man by the trees in the moonlight. He's pointing towards the house. The stranger shrugs his shoulders, spreads his hands and they both withdraw into the belt of trees and disappear. Collecting moths in the woods? I wonder. Amuse yourself as you wish, Harry, and think of your figure when you take that fifth glass. Today I walked along the river. Tomorrow I shall visit the sea for the first time. Your affectionate wife, Donna. You wish to see me, my lady? After lunch, William, I would like you to take some flowers to Lady Godolphin. Today, my lady? If you please, William. I, I believe the groom is doing nothing, my lady. I wish the groom to take Miss Henrietta and Master James and the nurse for a picnic in the carriage. Very well, my lady. Tell one of the maids to turn back my bed and draw the curtains. I shall rest this afternoon. Yes, my lady. Butterflies, warm air, drowsy bees, the glimmer of water, the stealthy branch of the parent river creeping into the woods, an enchantment, a new escape, a lotus land. A heron stands in the shallows, solemn and grey, his head sunk into his hooded shoulders. Beyond him, an oyster catcher and a curlew. Navarin is a place to drowse, a place to escape. Water oozing away from the mud flats, the creek still and soundless, hidden from everyone. The creek widens, 
opening out into a pool, and... Oh, there it is. The painted ship I saw before, here at anchor. The painted ship, red and golden in the setting sun. On the quay, tackle, blocks and ropes. It must be very deep water where the ship lies, for the tide froths and bubbles away. They seem to be making some repairs. There is a boat tied alongside. No one would ever know that a ship lies at anchor in this pool, shrouded by the trees and hidden from the open river. La Mouette. The ship's name written with a flourish in gold letters on her side. La Mouette. I wonder what that means. I should go back to the house. Pretend I've never seen the ship. Forget about it. Godolphin and his turnip friends can put up with it. The county can suffer. I do not care. <gasps> what have we here, then? <gasps> Let me go! Oh, I'll kill you! Come on. If you want walk, oh. I shall have to carry you. Oh. You're not very heavy. Oh. Ah. If you promise not to shout, oh. I'll take this coat off your head. Do you promise? There we are. Thank God. How dare you? Well, well. Let me go at once. Oh, not quite yet. I must see what I have snared. Let go. I do not want to hurt you. I shall shout for help. There is no one to hear you. That is better. You will not get away with this. Oh, but I will. I always do. Where are you taking me? To my ship, where I can entertain you without fear that you will fly away. You are mad. Indeed. Who are you? My name, madame, is Jean Benoit Aubary, at your service. Perhaps you do not know who I am. Oh, but I do. Welcome to La Mouette, Lady Donna Saint Colombe. <laughs> In part one of Frenchman's Creek by Daphne du Maurier, Donna St. Colum was played by Lorna Heilbronn and Jean by Struan Roger. Harry was played by Michael Cochran. Rockingham by Christopher Godwin. William, Michael Tudor Barnes and Lord Godolphin by Norman Bird. Prue was Elizabeth Mansfield and Henrietta, Susan Sheridan. Frenchman's Creek by Daphne du Maurier was dramatized for radio by Micheline Wando and directed by Cherry Cookson. Surprise, Lady Saint Colum. It's like a room in a house with chairs and paintings of birds everywhere. I can smell soup. You thought we pirates would be desperate creatures with rings in our ears and knives between our teeth. We're just ordinary men, you know. We scrub the decks and we cook vegetable soup, that is all. It seems you've been spying on my ship. On the contrary, it seems your men have been trespassing on my land. Oh, my very humble apologies. I had not expected the lady of the manor to visit me in person. As a rule, we have no trouble. You have been more bold than most. You are not hurt, are you? No, but I am not used to being treated in such a manner. It will do you no harm. What damned insolence. What do you propose to do with me? Ah, there you have me. I must look up my book of rules. Excuse me. 
Yes, prisoners, method of capture, questioning, detainment, yes, it is all here. But unfortunately, these notes relate to the capture and treatment of male prisoners, and I have no arrangements to deal with females. It really is most remiss of me. <laughs> yeah, that is better. Anger does not become the Lady Sankulum, the spoiled darling of the court, the Lady Donna who drinks in the London taverns with her husband's friends. You are quite a celebrity. How do you know? I have ears. That's finished. Over and done with. For the time being. Forever. These drawings, are they yours? Yes. This heron is always on the mud by the head of the creek when the tide ebbs. It is one of his feeding grounds. I saw an oyster catcher on the river, and another bird, a curlew, I think. Yes, they would be there too. The night jars are farther down the creek. They are so wary, though, it is almost impossible to get really close. I've never heard a night jar. You must know the creek very well. It is my refuge. I come here to do nothing. And to commit acts of piracy against my countrymen? And commit acts of piracy against your countrymen. <laughs> you like the drawings? <laughs> they are beautiful. So many gulls. They have a fellow feeling for the ship. That is why she is called La Mouette. Ah! Oh, La Mouette, the seagull, of course. Why are you a pirate? Why do you ride spirited horses? Because of the danger, because of the speed, because I might fall. That is why I'm a pirate. Yes. It I... is simple. I have no grudge against society, no bitter hatred of my fellow men. It just happens that piracy suits my inclinations. It is not all brutality and bloodshed. It takes many hours of organization. Every detail of a landing has to be thought out and prepared. I hate disorder. It is a geometrical problem, food for the brain. Do you mind if I smoke? Of course not. Good Lord. What is the matter? A tobacco jar, a, a volume of French poetry, the drawing of a seagull on a title page, William running to the belt of trees. Well, well. All these months while I was in London, you have been sleeping in my bed at Navron. How very remiss of William not to have noticed that I left my tobacco and my book in your bedroom. In the winter it can be very damp in the creek. It made a luxurious change to seek the comfort of your bedroom. I consulted your portrait. My lady, I said, would you grant a very weary Frenchman the courtesy of your bed? And it seemed to me that you bowed gracefully and gave permission. Sometimes you even smiled. It was very wrong of you. Very irregular. I know. Besides being dangerous. Ah, that was the fun of it. If I had known... What would you have done? I should have dismissed William and set a watch on the estate. When I lay in your bed, looking up at your portrait, that was not how you behaved. How did I behave? You joined my ship's company. You signed your name amongst the faithful. You were the first and the last woman to do so. Here, in this book. Take the quill. Think of your husband in London, yawning over his cards. Think of Lord Godolphin, who has visited you. Think of the good soup you can smell. The wine I shall offer you. No. No. What is the time? The children will have returned from their picnic. They will be calling for me. You are free to go and to return. The creek is yours. The ship is yours. You are one of us. Will you sign? Oh, this is madness. I must go. Very well. And is Navron House to be barred and bolted? Is William to be dismissed? No, of course not. I must return your call then, as a matter of courtesy. What is the correct hour? In the afternoon, I believe, between three and four. 
Pirates do not call upon ladies in the afternoon. They come stealthily at night, knocking upon a window. The lady of the manor, fearful of her safety, gives him supper by candlelight. Tomorrow, then, at ten o'clock. You wish to see me, my lady? Yes, William. I'm giving a small supper party late tomorrow night. Very well, my lady. How many will you be? Only two. Myself and one other. A gentleman. Yes, my lady. You need not mention the visit to anyone in the house, William. You are dreadfully shocked. Oh, nothing you or my master ever did could possibly shock me, my lady. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my solemn William, you have guessed. Your eyes are, if I may say so, without giving offence, my lady, very much alive. I have always known that sooner or later you would meet. Although I am a lady of the manor, married and respectable, with two children, and your master a lawless Frenchman and a pirate... Perhaps because of all those things, my lady. Do you approve of your master's profession, William? A pirate is a rebel and an outcast. Piracy suits my master. His ship is his kingdom, and no man can command him. But piracy is wrong. He robs those who can afford to be robbed, my lady. The poorer people in Brittany often benefit. The moral issue does not concern him. If I were a man, William, I would find my ship and go forth, a law unto myself. Now, what shall we eat? Crab, dressed and prepared in the French fashion, Small new potatoes cooked in their skins, a fresh green salad sprinkled with garlic, with tiny scarlet radishes, and thin narrow wafers interlaced with cream with the first wild strawberries of the year. Will that do, my lady? Oh, yes, William. Here he comes, across the lawn. His long coat is wine-coloured, and his sash is the same. There is lace at his throat and at his wrists. The moonlight touches his white stockings and glimmers on his silver buckled shoes. You may smoke. Here. Oh, my tobacco, thank you. When I came here in the winter, the covers shrouded the furniture and there were no flowers. William cooked me a chop and served it on a chipped plate and told me I must be content. The house looks very different now. I hope it is to your taste. I shall take you fishing and roast your catch on a fire. You will have to eat it with your fingers. I shall look forward to that. When did you become a pirate? Once there was a man called Jean Benoit Aubary, who had estates in Brittany, money, friends, responsibilities, and a servant called William. William's master became weary of Jean Benoit Aubary, and so he turned into a pirate and built La Mouette. Is it really possible to become someone else? I found it so. Are you happy? I am content. What is the difference? Contentment is when mind and body work in harmony. Happiness is more elusive. It approaches ecstasy and comes perhaps once in a lifetime. There is another kind of happiness in the pleasure I have when I've made a drawing and it has the shape and form I wanted. It is easier for a man. His happiness comes in the things he makes with his hands, with his brains, with his talents. But women have babies. That is a greater achievement. I mean, you have children, have you not? Yes, too. When you held them for the first time, did you not say to yourself, this is something I have done myself? Was that not near to happiness? Perhaps. May I uh, draw you? Now? Yes. Uh, no, 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 don't move. The uh, portrait of you upstairs, sir. Uh, when was that painted? Soon after I became betrothed to Harry. How long have you been married? Seven years. Henrietta is six. 
What decided you upon marriage? Harry was amusing, and I liked his eyes. He drank too much on our wedding night. I started Henrietta almost immediately. I was entirely unlike myself, not being able to ride, walk, or, or do all the things I wanted to do. I couldn't explain to Harry. I still don't understand why you are a pirate and rob Cornishmen and make Cornish women go in fear of more than their lives. The Cornish women flatter themselves. Frenchmen have a reputation for gallantry which is entirely without foundation. We are shyer than you give us credit for. Here. I finished your portrait. It is only a sketch. What do you think? You have made me appear older than I am. Possibly. There is something petulant about the mouth. I dare say. And a curious frown between the brows. Yes. It is someone whose illusions have been lost. Someone who looks out upon the world from too narrow a casement, finding it bitter and a little worthless. I don't think I like it very much. I apologize. It was an unpardonable thing to do. You told me yesterday that I had been trespassing on your land. It is a fault of mine in more ways than one. If I drew you at another time playing with your children, for example, or on my ship, the drawing would be entirely different. Then you might accuse me of flattering you. Forgive me. The truth is, I was ashamed because someone else had seen me as I too often see myself. Supposing the artist bears a similar blemish himself. Need uh, the sitter feel ashamed? You mean there would be a bond between them? Exactly. The east wind is blowing and my ship will be weather bound. Perhaps you will visit me and let me draw you again. Or well, do not forget, you still have to sign your name in my book. I shall not forget. Ah. Thank you for my supper. Good night. Good night. rather warm in here, but uh, because of Lady Godolphin's condition, I have commanded that the windows be shut. <laughs> Would you like another piece of cake? No, thank you, Lord Godolphin. Do you not miss life at court, Lady St. Column? Not at all, Lady Godolphin. And the pleasures of the king? <sighs> it is a great pity that Navron is so isolated. If only we were all a little nearer to you, we could meet more often. You show remarkable courage living there. All alone. You are, I trust, amply protected. You have servants you can trust. Implicitly. Oh. Godolphin has told you, I think, how we are menaced from the sea. By an elusive Frenchman. Yes, Lord Penrose. Who may not remain elusive very much longer. Indeed. The authorities are of no help. We shall deal with the foreigner ourselves. Providing enough of us join together. What exactly is your plan of capture? It is as yet in embryo, madam, but I would warn you that we suspect some of the country people in the district to be in the Frenchman's pay. You astound me. We believe the Frenchman has a hiding place along the coast. Have you not made a thorough search? My dear Lady St. Column, we are forever combing the district. But the fellow is as slippery as an eel, and he appears to know our coast better than we do ourselves. You have, I suppose, seen nothing of a suspicious nature around Navron. Any strange craft entering or leaving the estuary? No, nothing whatever. I have no wish to alarm you, but he is the type of man who would have little respect for your person. You mean he is quite unscrupulous? I fear so. And his men are most desperate and savage? They are pirates, madam, and Frenchmen at that. Oh, no! Are they, do you think, cannibals also? My baby son is only just three. <laughs> Calm yourself, Lucy. Lady St. Column's jesting. The matter is not to be treated with levity, Lady St. Column. Forgive me. I shall bar and bolt my house, 
and with neighbours such as yourselves and the Penroses, I am sure no harm can come to me. When I catch the Frenchman, it will be my very special pleasure to hang him from the tallest tree in Godolphin's Park just before sundown. Sir, you are very bloodthirsty. So would you be, madam, if you had been robbed of your silver and plate. Think what joy you will have replacing them. I fear I consider the matter in a very different light. I must say that Harry's presence in the neighbourhood would be of enormous assistance. Once he knows that piracy is rampant on the coast... I have already mentioned it to him. Were I in his shoes, I would never have permitted you to travel west alone. Women without their husbands have been known to lose their heads. Only their heads? <clears throat> if you came face to face with a pirate, I dare say you would shiver and swoon like the rest of your sex. It looks as if some women in the hamlet hereabouts have suffered at the hands of these damned scoundrels. <laughs> you may find they did not suffer at all, but on the contrary, enjoyed themselves immensely. I do think, Lord Godolphin, you should not distress your dear wife with such talk. How long has your master been anchored in the creek, William? Uh, about a month, my lady. What is his usual visit? Five or six days, my lady. I see. It is rather strange that before I came to Navron, I thought very little about birds and even less of fishing. It is rather strange, my lady. I suppose the desire to know about these things is always lying dormant. Indeed. Uh, your old gown is behind the cushion, my lady. Thank you. Do you think me mad, William? Shall we say, not entirely sane, my lady? I shall be in the avenue shortly after ten o'clock, William. You will drive me to the house as though we were just returning from Lord Godolphin's. Yes, my lady. What are you smiling at? Uh, I was not aware, my lady, that my features were in any way relaxed. Hand me that stone. This one? Yes, thank you. Now we fasten it to a long length of rope, throw it overboard, and we shall come to anchor. Down the ebbing tide come little wisps of grass, a fallen leaf or two. The thin, wet line between my fingers pools gently. I examine the hook. A dark ribbon of seaweed clings to the end of the line. You are letting it touch the bottom. Are you tired of fishing? I was thinking. They were all gloating over your capture this afternoon. <laughs> that does not worry me. Penrose is not a pompous dunderhead like a dolphin. He means to hang you from the tallest tree in Godolphin's Park. That is a compliment. You think that, like all women, I am afire with rumours and gossip. Like all women, you dramatise events. And you ignore them. Oh. What would you have me do? Be cautious. Penrose said that the country people know you have a hiding place. Did they uh, tell you how they proposed to capture me? No. Neither shall I tell you how I propose to evade them. Do you think for one moment I should... I believe you have a fish on your line. Hey, give it to me. I can do it myself. Oh, the, the line is tangled. Gently now, bring him to the side of the boat. Oh. No, 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 don't pull quite so hard. There now, gently. I have done it. Oh, poor thing, he is dying. I am hurting him. What shall I do? This. You have killed him. Of course. He is close to me. His hands are beside my hands. I want him closer still, with his lips touching mine and his hands beneath my back. Are you hungry? Yes. I'll row us to land. Oh, listen. The night jar. The golden lights of evening have gone, and the sky is paler now. There is a smell of moss about the air, and the bitter tang of bluebells in the wood. At the entrance to the creek, where the trees crowd to the water's edge, we climb ashore. I find dry twigs. I break them across my knee. My dress is torn and crumpled, and I wish Lord Godolphin and his lady wife could see me now. The sticks crackle and flare. The trees throw long shadows down to the quay. The fish roasts in the fire. We look at one another across the flames. 
There is a radiance in the deepening sky that belongs only to a midsummer night. Uh, you'll have to eat the fish with your fingers and drink the wine from the bottle. Not like suppers at the Swan in London. What do you know of my suppers at the Swan? The Lady Saint Colombe sucks cheek by jowl with the ladies of the town and later roisters about highways like a boy, returning home as the night watchman seeks his bed. You think this is a brief interlude in a series of escapades? I did not say that. You think I am a spoiled whore lusting after new sensations without even a whore's excuse of poverty. I wish I was back at Navron with James staggering on fat, unsteady legs. I can pick him up in my arms and hold him tight and bury my face in his smooth, fat neck and forget this new anguish that fills my heart. Are you not thirsty? No. In the winter, when I used to lie in your room at Navron, I made my own pictures of you in my mind. I would see you fishing or watching the sea from the decks of La Mouette. Somehow, the pictures would not fit with the servant's gossip. How unwise of you to make pictures of someone you had never seen. How unwise of you to leave your portrait in your bedroom untended and alone with a pirate landing on the English coast. You might have turned it with its face to the wall or even put another in its place. The true Donna St. Colum, roistering at the swan and dressing up in the breeches of her husband's friends. You should have been born a boy. You're an outlaw at heart. Dressing up in breeches and frightening old women was the nearest thing to piracy you could imagine. Or you do not care for killing fishes, either. You are mocking me. When I was a boy, to make my soldiering more realistic, I would paint my hands red and pretend to be wounded. But when I saw blood on a dog that was dying, I ran away and was sick. And now you are a pirate, and fighting is your life, robbing and killing and hurting. On the contrary, I am often very frightened. Yes, but not in the same way, not frightened of yourself. No, 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 that has gone forever. Your friends, Penrose and Godolphin, shall have a run for their money. You are going to do something dangerous? Risk capture and possibly death? Yes. Why? Because I want the satisfaction of proving to myself that my brain is better than theirs. That is a ridiculous reason. It is my reason, nevertheless. It is an egotistical thing to say, a sublime form of conceit. It would be wiser to sail back to Brittany. Far wiser. La Mouette may be wrecked instead of lying peacefully at anchor in a port across the channel. La Mouette was not built to lie peacefully in a port. If, um, you were a boy, you could come with me. But then, women who are afraid of killing fishes are too delicate and precious for pirate ships. Do you really believe that? You would be seasick. Nonsense. You would be cold, uncomfortable and frightened. <laughs> you... you would beg me to put you ashore just as my plans were about to work. How much will you wager? Ah. Well, it depends on what we have to offer each other. My necklace. You can have my ruby necklace, the one I wore when you visited me at Navron. Now, that would be a prize indeed. There would be little excuse for piracy if I possessed that. And if I win, I want... a lock from Godolphin's wig. You shall have the wig itself. Very good. Then we need discuss the matter no further. When do we sail? When the ship is ready. The fire is low. It is getting late. William will be waiting with the carriage. I trust you enjoyed your dinner with Lord Godolphin? Very much indeed. And the fish was not too indifferently cooked? The fish was delicious. You will lose your appetite when you go to sea. Sea air will make me ravenous. We shall have to sail with the wind and the tide. It will mean leaving before dawn. The best time of day. I shall be ready when you send for me. All the restless devils inside me are appeased. I've fallen under a spell which echoes within me, as though I've come to a place I've already known and deeply desired, but have lost through my own carelessness or circumstance. As I come out into the avenue, under the tall beech trees, 
The branches stir softly, like a whisper of things to come. In part two of Frenchman's Creek by Daphne du Maurier, Donis and Colum was played by Lorna Heilbronn and Jean by Struan Roger. William was Michael Tudor Barnes, Lord Godolphin, Norman Byrd, Lady Godolphin, Susan Sheridan, and Lord Penrose, Christopher Good. Frenchman's Creek by Daphne du Maurier was dramatized for radio by Micheline Wando and directed by Cherry Cookson. Five days since I supped with my French pirate in the creek. Sometimes I think of my husband Harry in London, riding, gaming, playhouses, card parties. He comes from another world, a past that is dead and gone. Harry himself has become a kind of ghost, a phantom figure walking in another time. The other Donner is dead too. And this woman who has taken her place is waiting in a house in Cornwall for her next adventure. Frenchman's Creek by Daphne de Maurier. Dramatized in six parts by Micheline Wandor. With Lorna Heilbronn as Donis and Colin, Struan Roger as Jean, and Michael Tudor Barnes as William. Part 3 Cabin Boy and Lover. Wake up, my lady. Wake up. What? Monsieur has sent word. The ship sails within the hour. What time is it? A quarter to four, my lady. Oh, I must hurry. I will supervise the house in your absence, my lady, and see that Prue does not neglect the children. I have every confidence in you, William. You may frown upon Miss Henrietta if she talks too much. Yes, my lady. And should Master James very much desire a second helping of strawberries... I am to give them to him, my lady. When Prue is not looking... Do you wish you were coming with me? <laughs> Unfortunately, my lady, I possess an interior that does not take kindly to the motion of the ship upon the water. I have a wager with your master that I shall not succumb. Do you think I shall win? It depends upon what your ladyship is alluding to. That I shall not succumb to the motion of the ship, of course. William, you are very French in your ideas. Forgive me, my lady. Yes, I think you will win your wager. It is the only wager we have, William. Indeed, my lady. Look, the sun is rising. You must go. I shall announce to the household this morning that your ladyship is indisposed, a trifle feverish, and that for fear of infection, you would prefer that no one came to your room but myself. Excellent, William. You are, if I may say so, a born deceiver. Uh, women have occasionally informed me so, my lady. <laughs> I believe you to be heartless, William. Are you sure I can trust you all alone amongst a pack of scatterbrained females? I will be a father to them, my lady. Goodbye then, William. Look after them for me. As I climb the ladder to the high poop deck, I can see the ship is ready for sea, the decks clear, the men standing at their appointed places. I hear the rattle of the cable in the hawser, the grind of the capstan and the stamping of feet. Ready ahead! 
This is a different man from my companion of the river, who built a wood fire on the quay and cooked fish, his sleeves rolled above his elbows, his hair falling into his eyes. Slowly the wind fills the great sails. The ship creeps down the creek like a ghost, now and again brushing the trees. And now the wide parent river opens up before us, and the wind comes full and true from the west, sending a ripple on the surface. La Mouette meets the strength of it, healing slightly her decks aslant, a little whipping spray over the bulwark. Dawn is breaking, and the sky has a dull haze and a glow that promises fine weather. There is a salty tang in the air, a freshness from the open sea beyond the estuary. Do you like it? Of course I like it. And I am filled with a great ecstasy, for I know that he is mine, and I love him. I am part of his body and part of his mind. We belong to each other, wanderers, fugitives, cast in the same mold. I think this ship is bewitched. That is the effect she first had upon me. And you do not feel sick. I have never felt better. Would you like to sail the ship? I? Sail the ship? Of course. Oh, what do I do? Uh, hold the spokes in your two hands and keep her steady on her course. I, I can't see what I'm doing. The wind is blowing my hair over my eyes. I'll hold your ringlets back. There. Thank you. Do you know what Lady St. Colum is doing now? I should love to know. She is lying in bed with a feverish chill, and she will receive no one in her room except William, her faithful servant, who now and again brings her grapes to soothe her fever. If Lady St. Colum tosses on a bed of fever, who is this woman steering my ship? She is a cabin boy, the most insignificant member of your crew. My cabin boy is not at all suitably dressed. We must find you some clothes. What about the wheel? The ship can take care of herself. This is her weather. She will keep to her course all day with a finger to the wheel now and again. One of the men is about your size. He has a pair of breeches. He keeps her saint stays and confession. They should be clean enough. He can lend you a shirt, too, and stockings and shoes. Shall I cut off my hair with a pair of scissors? You would look more like a cabin boy, perhaps. But I would rather risk capture than have you do it. I feel marvelously free without petticoats and ribbons. How do I look? Wonderful. Now I can see the Lady St. Colomb who masqueraded as a highwayman in London. Tell me where we are going. We are bound for Foy Haven. Now, here is a plan of the harbour. The main anchorage is there, in deep water opposite the town. And there is a fort at the entrance to the haven and two castles, one on either side of the channel. These will not be guarded. This is where we shall be lying, a mile or so to the east of the haven. We shall go ashore here on this beach. There is a rough path up to the cliff, and then we strike inshore and come to a creek. At the entrance to the creek, moored to a buoy, we shall find Lord Penrose's ship, the Merry Fortune. Ah. Now, this ship has come from the Indies. My intention is to seize her as she lies at anchor, put some of my crew on board, and have them sail her to the French coast. But suppose her men outnumber yours? Uh, that is one of the risks I take. The essential thing is the element of surprise. You can wait for us here. Oh, no. I shall come with you. Ah, good. For I still have our wager. Our wager? Oh, yes. Surely you haven't forgotten. You told me you wanted Lord Godolphin's wig. I am a gentleman. I always honor my wages.
The night is dark and still. A small breeze comes from the north. Lamouette lies at anchor on the fringe of a bay, close to great cliffs, shadowy and indistinct in the darkness. There's something eerie in the stillness, something strange, as though we have come unwittingly to a land of sleep. These cliffs tonight are a hostile place. I am in enemy territory. For the first time since I arrived on board, I have a sudden chill of fear. If the plan fails and we are captured, Harry will probably blow his brains out. The children will be orphaned, forbidden to speak their mother's name. A woman who ran away after a French pirate, like a kitchen maid after a groom. Give me your hand. The men will spread out across country, and we shall meet at Lord Penrose's ship. Look, you can still see La Mouette. There is a riding light high in the rigging. Oh yes, she looks so far away. Now the wind is back to the southwest. You can smell it—a tangy, wet smell. Now the tide will be our only ally, for the wind has changed sides and become a hostile force. Donna. Yes, Jean. The weather is going to play us false. It is raining already. You still have time to return to the ship. I'm not going back. Not now. Why do you want to stay? You know why I want to stay. I want you to go back for the same reason. Oh, stay then, and we will make a fight of it and hang together from the same tree, you and I. Now then, we shall have to persuade Lord Penrose to board his ship. He will be less danger to us there than raising the devil ashore and sending a cannonball across our bows as we pass the fort. Would you like to do something with a spice of danger in it? Yes, tell me. I want you to go and call on Lord Penrose. You can't mistake his house. It is hard by the church facing the quay. You can see it from here. There's a light upon it now. I can see it. Go and tell him that his presence is urgently required aboard his ship. Make up any story you like. Play any part you have a fancy for, but keep in the shadow. You are possible enough for a cabin boy in darkness, but uh, a woman under the light. Suppose he refuses to come. He will not refuse. Not if you are clever. And if he suspects me and keeps me there, I shall deal with him. I shall be waiting for you in a boat by the quay when your mission is accomplished. Go now. A house standing alone in the street by the side of the hill. A light in the lower casement, glowing through the drawn curtains. The street is deserted. There's a gale blowing up from the southwest, Penrose. Lord Godolphin. It's a pity you did not moor the ship up the river. They may have trouble with her in the morning if this weather continues. Godolphin here, within three feet of me, dropping the ash from his disgusting pipe onto my shoulder. Shaw's mad. He's planned not only to capture the ship but to seize Godolphin's wig. Open up there. Who's there? Lord Penrose is wanted. The master is anxious to move the ship now before the gale worsens. What is it? Go inside, boy. No, sir. I'm wet to the skin. Sir, the master says there is no time to lose. The ship is in danger. What is wrong with the ship? I must go, sir. Make haste. The gale is freshening. A man stands on the quay. It must be the night watchman. What if the boarding of the ship has not gone according to plan? What if the resistance has been stronger than they expected, and they are fighting now on the decks of Penrose's ship? I say there, the night watchman. Hey, you fellow! Hide, hide. Yes, sir. Have you seen a lad run this way? I've seen no one, but there's something amiss yonder, sir. Looks as though your vessel has broken from the buoy. What's that? Then the lad did not lie after all. Thank goodness for that. Look, sir, they're getting sail on her. The master must be going to take her up river. The fellow's crazy. There are not a dozen men on board. They'll have her gone before they're finished. We must get all hands on her. Ring the alarm bell. Right away, sir. Ahoy there, Mary Fortune. Ahoy! Get me a boat. Come on, man. A boat. She's helpless. The tide's taking her to the rocks. 
They must be mad aboard or dead drunk. Hurry up with that boat. Someone's been missing with a rope. It's been cut. Then swim, swim and bring your boat. By God, I'll thrash the fellow who played the trick. I'll have him hanged. I can see the men at the yards. The great topsail shaking out. The sail is drawing taut. Ahoy there! Ahoy! He's crazy! He's making for the harbour mouth! Three boats out in a line abreast, with a warp from the ship to each of them, and every man in them bent double to his oars. The topsail fills and pools, and the ship heels to a great puff of wind. He's going to sea. By God, he's taking her to sea! Warn the soldiers at the fort! I must get back to shore! Leave that boy! The peace of Abraham! Catch him! Catch that boy! Catch him. Catch that boy. I must warn Shaw that the alarm has been sent to the fort. My hair has come loose. I can't see. The wind is whipping my eyes. Oh, rocks, wet, slippery, blood on my hands. Blood on my face. The wind has shifted. Ah, oh, the Merry Fortune is sailing seaward. Nothing matters now. I don't even care if the dolphin recognizes me. The Merry Fortune is sailing away. Donna! Sure. I'm over here! Oh. Oh. oh! You are hurt, Donna. It is nothing. The soldiers in the fort! Hurry! We must row out to the ship. Come on. Catch the rope, Donna. I have it. Nearly there. You have a cut on your chin, Jaw. You have a cut on your chin, too. Get down. Shot has fallen short. Save your powder, boys. You'll not catch us this time. There is your friend down in that boat. Do you know if he shoots straight? I doubt it very much. There's a woman aboard. Look there. Greetings to you, gentlemen. And a safe passage back to Foy Key. Before you leave, however, we would like something to remember you by. Excuse me, gentlemen. Now, my lord Godolphin, you will pardon me if I knock your hat into the water? It is your great curled periwig which attracts me. See how neatly it fits the point of my sword. God damn it! Oh, oh, oh. Thank you and farewell! His head was as bald as a naked baby. Well, my lady San Colomb, and what about our wager? You have won the wager, Monsieur Jean. Oh. What is it? I feel terribly sick. Yes, yes, please do. How do you feel? I am better. What is the time? Uh, three o'clock in the afternoon. What day is it? Sunday. Your friend Godolphin will have missed his morning in church unless there is a good barber in Foy. Look. <laughs> Godolphin's curled periwig. <laughs> It's all coming back to me. I was terribly sick. Oh, I have seen far worse. Here, some bread and cheese. Can you eat? Oh, I'm starving. Oh, my clothes. Where are my clothes? Uh, they're being washed. Uh, drape the blanket around your shoulders. Oh, no, 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 wait. You forgot the Merry Fortune has been to the Indies. Ah, here. Scarlet, gold, and a silver fringe. Perhaps Godolphin had this shawl in mind for his wife. To think that we might have been hanging from a tree in Godolphin's park. Hmm. What are we going to do now? Oh, I never make plans on a Sunday. Have some wine. Do you always have the devil's own luck, Frenchman? Always. Where are the crew? 
Oh, we burned them back to back, gagged them, cast them adrift in a boat. No one was hurt. Mm. I am glad it is over. I enjoyed the danger, but I do not want to do it again. I thought my heart would burst. You did not do too badly for a cabin boy. How long shall we stay on the Merry Fortune? Why? Do you want to go home? No. I just wondered. I'll leave a handful of men to take the Merry Fortune into a port in Brittany, and then we shall return to England on board La Mouette. Then where do we go? Well, back to Helford, of course. Do you not want to see your children? Oh, yes, I do. Of course I do. But I don't want to leave the ship. I cannot get up until my clothes are dry. No. How long will they take to dry in the sun? Oh, uh, at least three hours. Perhaps you should lower a boat and send someone to La Moette for my gown. Everyone is asleep. Don't you know that Frenchmen like to be idle between one and five in the afternoon? In England, people never sleep in the afternoon. Then I shall follow your custom. After you have paid me your debt. My debt? Oh, surely you have not forgotten. I must remind you, my Lady saint Colomb, that you lost a wager. I know. I succumbed to the sea. You must pay your forfeit now. Must I? You owe me your ruby necklace. No, 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 do not give it to me. I shall take it for myself. Do you know what day it is? Sunday. You told me. Midsummer's Day. The longest day of the year. Come closer. shining on my head, the spray blowing on the deck, the warm, pungent odour of tar and rope and blue salt water, the feel of his back against mine all night. This is our day, our moment. This ship is so easy to steer. Look, you can see the coast of Cornwall in the distance. This could be tomorrow and the next day and a year ahead. In other countries, on other rivers. And what about Donna St. Colomb? Perhaps at this very moment she is walking in the bedroom at Navron with her fever gone, remembering only very faintly a dream she has had. She has not woken yet. And her dreams are of a loveliness that she never knew before. Now, for all that, they are still dreams. And in the morning, she will wake. No, just this. The ship, the surge of water, the taste of the sea, and your hand here against my heart. Donna, I could sail away now in La Mouette and come back in 20 years' time, and what should I find? A placid, comfortable woman with her dreams long forgotten. And I myself, a weather-beaten mariner, bearded, stiff in the joints, my taste for piracy gone. My Frenchman paints a dismal picture of the future. Your Frenchman is a realist. And if I sailed with you now and never returned to Navron? Who can tell? Regret, perhaps? Disillusion? Not with you. Never with you. Well then, perhaps no regrets. But more nests and more broods, and I would sail alone again. You see, Donna, there is no escape for a woman. Only for a night and a day. You are right. There is no escape for a woman. So if I sail with you again, I shall be cabin boy and wear breeches once and for always. You can make your landings on the coast and I, the humble cabin boy, will prepare your meals and I'll ask no questions and refrain from touching you. Oh, how long will you be content with that? For as long as we please. We wouldn't last a single hour. I suppose I must return to Navron. 
And then? If all is well with the children, I will return to the creek. We shall breakfast together and then we'll go fishing. We'll swim at noon when the sun is hottest on the water. And the heron will come down to feed with the turn of the tide, so you can draw him again. And where will the Lady St. Colomb be? Lying in her great canopy bed in London, restless and lonely, knowing nothing of this she belongs to yesterday. There is a mist upon the water. I shall put on my gown. I wrap my cloak about me, and once more I am Donna St. Colum. And my cabin boy? Your cabin boy is sulking and impatient until the day he can sail with you again. Goodbye, my Frenchman. Hurry back, Donna. As soon as you can. And somewhere, too, there is a donor of tomorrow, a donor of the future, of ten years away, to whom all this will be a thing to cherish, a thing to remember. Much will be forgotten then, perhaps. The sound of the tide on the mud flats, the dark sky, the dark water, the shiver of trees behind us, and the shadows they cast before them, and the smell of the young bracken and moss and of the sea. Even the things we said will be forgotten, the touch of hands, the warmth, the loveliness, but never the peace that we have given to each other, never the stillness and the silence. In part three of Frenchman's Creek by Daphne du Maurier, Donna St. Colum was played by Lorna Heilbronn and Jean by Struan Roger. William was Michael Tudor Barnes, Lord Godolphin, Norman Bird, Lord Penrose, Christopher Good, and the night watchman, Michael Kilgariff. Frenchman's Creek by Daphne du Maurier was dramatized for radio by Micheline Wandor and directed by Cherry Cookson. Frenchman's Creek by Daphne du Maurier. Dramatized in six parts by Micheline Wandor. With Lorna Heilbronn as Donna St. Colum, Michael Tudor Barnes as William, Michael Cochran as Harry, and Christopher Godwin as Rockingham. Part four, Danger. Are you there? Hush, my lady. What is the matter? You look as though you haven't slept. Is it the children? Has something happened to the children? You must be quiet, my lady. What is it? Sir Harry has come just before sundown. Lord Rockingham is with him. Come into the salon, William. Tell me. I gather that Sir Harry was becoming restless in London without you, my lady. It seems that Lord Rockingham met a relative of Lord Godolphin's in Whitehall, who told him that Sir Harry's presence in Cornwall was urgently needed. That is all I could discover from their conversation at supper, my lady. Yes, it would be Rockingham. Harry is too lazy to come without persuasion. 
How did you keep him from my room? I said you had been in bed for several days with a high fever, and that at last you were obtaining some measure of sleep, and it would be extremely prejudicial to your health if Sir Harry as much as ventured into the room. And he accepted your story? Like a lamb, my lady. He swore a trifle at first and cursed me for not having sent for him, but I explained that it was your ladyship's strict orders that he was not to be told. Miss Henrietta and Master James told Sir Harry the same tale, that your ladyship was poorly and confined to your bed. And Prue also came with a woebegone face, saying that your ladyship would not even admit her to tend upon you. What did my Lord Rockingham say to all this? His lordship appeared disappointed, my lady, that you were not down to receive them. He looked upon me with curiosity. He would, William. Lord Rockingham has that sort of mind. At all costs, word must be sent to La Mouette, and the ship must leave the creek with the next tide. Oh, William. <laughs> it will all come right. Do not we? Forgive me. It's so silly. It is something to do with having been so happy. It does not happen often, does it? <laughs> Once in a million years, my lady. Yes, I know. Now, William, I shall go to my room and undress and get into bed. Call me with breakfast, and then I suppose I will have to see Sir Harry and find out how long he intends to stay. Very good, my lady. Word must be sent to your master in the creek. Yes, my lady. I shall go as soon as I can. Here they are, the threads of my normal life. James in his cot, face flushed, fists clenched. Henrietta lying on her face, her curls tumbled on the pillow. Now my Frenchman wakes, puts out his hand for me beside him and finds me gone. Now he remembers and smiles and stretches and yawns and watches the sun come up over the trees. He will eat breakfast without me and throw bread to the swans. This is the hell that comes with love, the agony beyond all enduring. After the beauty and the loveliness comes the sorrow and the pain. Come in. I have brought your breakfast, my lady. Thank you, William. Sir Harry bade me inquire whether you were sufficiently recovered for him to see you. I shall see him. If I may suggest, my lady, it would be prudent to draw the curtains a trifle so that your face is in shadow. Sir Harry might think it peculiar that you look so suspiciously well. My head is aching intolerably. From other causes, my lady. I have shadows beneath my eyes and I am exceedingly weary. Quite, my lady. I think you had better leave the room, William, before I throw my breakfast at you. Very good, my lady. Oh, uh, I had better leave you now. My lady. Oh, excuse me, Sir Harry. My dear Donna. Get down now, Duke Duchess. Can't you see your mistress is ill? Come here, you rascals. Come here. Oh, God damn it, it's warm this morning. Here I am, sweating through my shirt already, and it's not even ten o'clock. So, my dear, my dear, how are you? Are you better? Well, where did you get this confounded fever? Have you a kiss for me? Your wig is scratchy, Harry. Please don't kiss me. Ah, well, you don't look very ill, my beautiful, even in this light. Here was I expecting to find you at death's door itself, from what that fellow told me. What sort of servant is he, anyway? I'll dismiss him if you don't like him, you know. William is a treasure, the best servant I ever had. Oh, well, as long as he pleases you, that's all that matters. Mm. I must say, London has been damned dull without you. Not a play worth seeing. And I nearly lost a fortune of piquet the other night. Oh, the king has a new mistress. Some actress or other, they tell me. But I haven't seen her yet. Rockingham's here, and all agog to see you. And here we are, and you a confounded invalid. I am much better, Harry. Good, good. Well, I'm very glad to hear it. Here, Duchess, I'll give your mistress a kiss. Duchess has a sore patch on her back, and oh. she's nearly scratched herself raw. 
I've rubbed in some pomade, but it doesn't do her any good. I, um, I bought a new horse, by the way. She's down there in the stable. Chestnut with the juice of a temper, but she covers the ground quick enough. So the county is infested with pirates and robbery, rape and violence causing havoc amongst people, huh? Uh, where did you hear that? Oh, Rockingham brought back a story in town one day. Seems this infernal Frenchman sailed Penrose's vessel straight out of Foy Harbour right under his nose. I mean, what infernal impudence, eh? God knows what the vessel was worth. She was just home from the Indies. Penrose is coming this evening, by the way. Well, it was Rockingham's idea, really. We'll set a trap for the Frenchman, and when we've caught him, we'll string him up somewhere and give ourselves a laugh. That's his idea. So, Donna, when are you going to get up, eh? When you have left the room. <sighs> I don't get much fun out of my wife, do I, Duke? All right, then. We'll go. We're not wanted. Dogs are in the way. I'll, um, I'll tell Rockingham you're getting up. He'll be pleased as a cat with two tails. <laughs> coming here tonight. What if he recognises me? What if he remembers me staring down at him from the decks of La Mouette, my curls blowing loose, laughing at him? And Rockingham. He is no fool. He belongs to London, to the overheated and over-scented playhouse. He has come to break my peace here at Navron. Somewhere there is a woman who cares for none of this but lies upon a deck of a ship and laughs with her love and the taste of salt is on their lips and the warmth of the sun and the sea. So you have had a fever, Donna. A most becoming fever, I must say. Thank you, Rockingham. You don't appear delighted to see me. Why should I? I told Harry when I left London that I wanted to be alone. I am angry with both of you for breaking my peace. Oh, London in midsummer stinks too much, even for me. The country will do us both good. How long do you propose to stay? Until we've caught the pirate who seems to be giving you all so much trouble. He has gone back to France. I think not. Penrose told me that a fishing craft had reported seeing a vessel in the early hours of yesterday morning making towards the English coast. Some merchantman returning from abroad? The fisherman thought not. The coast of England goes a long way, my dear Rockingham. Yes, but the Frenchman seems to leave everything alone but for this narrow strip of Cornwall. Godolphin believes that he has even visited your Helford River here. Then he must do it by night when I am in bed and asleep. Mm, possibly. At any rate, he'll not dare do so much longer. I suppose there are many creeks and inlets round your little coast. No doubt Harry could tell you better than I. And the country hereabouts is sparsely inhabited. Navron is the only big house in the district, I believe. I suppose it is. Ideal for a lawbreaker, hmm? I almost wish I were a pirate myself. If I knew the house was without masculine protection and that the lady of the manor was as beautiful as you, Donna. Yes, Rockingham. If I were a pirate, I repeat, knowing all these things, I should be most tempted to return to the district again and again. But you are not a pirate, my dear Rockingham. You are only a grossly spoilt, overdressed, exceedingly decadent member of the aristocracy <laughs> with too great a fondness for women and alcohol. So shall we leave the subject alone? I am bored. You haven't lost your spirit, my dear Donna. Time was when you were not bored either by me or by my conversation. You flatter yourself. Do you remember a certain evening at Vauxhall? I remember many evenings at Vauxhall, and one in particular. Because I had drunk two glasses of wine and was feeling intolerably sleepy, you had the audacity to kiss me and I was too idle to protest. I disliked you afterwards and myself more so. The Cornish air has made you quite venomous. Are you as churlish as this to the curious-looking manservant who attends you? You had better ask him. If I were Harry, I should ask him many questions, and all of an extremely personal nature. Oh, what are you discussing, both of you? Oh, God, I'm hot. We were discussing your manservant, my dear Harry. So strange that Donna would permit no one else to attend her while she was ill. Yes, by heaven, he is a rum-looking fellow, and no mistake. Now, I wouldn't trust him too far if I were you, Donna. 
I mean, what do you see in him? He is quiet, he is discreet, he walks soundlessly. Well, Rock's quite right, you know. The fellow might have taken infernal liberties. It was a damned risky thing to do. You lying weak and helpless in bed and the, that fellow creeping round about you. I have a mind to dismiss it. You will do nothing of the kind. William will remain in my service for as long as it pleases all me. All right, all right. No need to be tricky about no, it. No, Lord, here he comes. Huh? He looks as if he was sickening for some fever himself. Oh. Excuse me, my lady. Yes, William? Uh, Prue wishes to talk to you about Master James. He is a little unwell. Very well, William. I'll come at once. Where is he, William? Master James is well, my lady. What is it, then? I have been down to the creek to warn my master, and I found the ship had grounded with the morning's tide, oh. a rock piercing her, planking under the water. They were working on her, but she will not be fit to sail for 24 hours. Oh, no. I trust little James is well. Oh, just a slight cold, that's all. Uh, excuse me, my lady. Of course, William. Are you following me, Rockingham? I did not think we had finished our conversation. Indeed. I cannot think of anything more I wish to say to you. It must be the fever that has altered you so. In town, you were never silent for five minutes at a time. I am getting old. In a few weeks, I shall be 30. A curious fever that leaves the patient so darkly coloured with eyes so large. You did not see a physician, it seems. I was my own physician. Ah, with the advice of the excellent William... <laughs> What an unusual accent he has, by the way. Quite a foreign intonation. All Cornishmen speak like that. Oh, I understand he is not a Cornishman at all. Perhaps he is from Devon, then. I have never questioned William about his ancestry. It seems that the house was entirely empty until you came. The unusual William took the responsibility of Navron upon his shoulders with no other servants to help him. I did not realise you engaged in stable gossip, Rockingham. Oh, my lady, it is one of my favourite pastimes. The chatter of backstairs is inevitably true and so extremely entertaining. Her ladyship, I understand, has a passion for long walks in the heat of the day. She takes joy, it seems, in wearing the oldest clothes and returning, sometimes splashed with mud and river water. Very true. I enjoy the exercise. Her ladyship's appetite is fitful, it appears. Sometimes she will sleep until nearly midday and then demand her breakfast. Or she will taste nothing from noon until ten o'clock at night. And then, when her servants are abed, the faithful William brings her supper. True again. Here, I am mistress of my own time and may do exactly as I please. And then, after having been in the rudest of health, she unaccountably takes to her bed and shuts her doors upon her household, even upon her children, because it seems she suffers from a fever, although no physician is sent for, and once again the unusual William is the only person admitted within her door. And what more? Only that you seem to have recovered very quickly from your fever and show not the slightest pleasure in seeing your husband or your closest friend. Oh. Why? What is wrong, my dear Donna? I have a headache. There must be thunder in the air. I trust you will be well enough for dinner. Of course. A ship has been seen drawing towards the coast. There are watchers on the headlands, spies in the hills. We shall have work to do before midnight. It is very close. I think I shall go and lie down for a while. <laughs> Outside, it has begun to rain. A soft, slow, insistent drizzle that chills and dampens everything. I am shivering with fear and apprehension. Watchers on the hills, spies on the headlands. Rockingham is the real threat. He is a man to be watched. My lady? Prue, will you send William to me? I'm sorry, my lady, but William's not in the house. Where is he? I don't know. He went out just after five o'clock and he's not returned. Where could he have gone? I've no idea, my lady. Two hours. Thank you, Prue. 
I shall go out for a walk. If William returns before I do, please tell him I wish to see him before dinner. William must have had the same idea as I did. He has come to warn Jean. What if... No, I must not imagine. Harry and Rockingham playing cards. Drinking. Swearing. Tonight I am alone. The grass is wet after the rain. And there is a silver sheen and a warm, damp smell in the air. Like an autumn mist. The sun has not returned after the rain. The heavy green foliage of midsummer makes a pool over my head. A man. Twenty yards away, he's back to a tree. A musket in his hands. That must be why William has not returned. Perhaps he's been caught. Or is in hiding in the woods. I must go back. is that fellow William? Harry, please, I am dressing for dinner. He has the key of the cellar and no one knows where he is. Perhaps he's talking to the grooms in the stables. He's not. The fellow simply disappeared. Here we are with George Godolphin and the rest coming to supper and no wine. I tell you, Donna, I won't stand for it. I shall sack him, you know. He will come back directly. There is still plenty of time. Well, that's what happens for a servant when there's no man about the place. You've let him do exactly as he pleases. On the contrary, he does exactly what pleases me. Well, I don't like it. Rock's quite right. The fellow has a familiar, impudent manner about it. You're drunk already, Harry, even without the key to the cellar. Hey, look here, Donna. Am I going to be allowed in here tonight with you? I thought you were to be employed in catching pirates. Oh, that'll be over by midnight. If the fellow's in hiding on the river somewhere, as Godolphin and Penrose seem to think, he won't stand a dog's chance. There are men posted everywhere, from here to the headland and on either side of the river. He won't slip away from the net this time. Oh, no. We'll all have a drink and no end of fun. You, uh, haven't answered my question, Donna. Knowing what you're usually like after midnight, you won't care very much if you lie down in my room or under the table. It's only because you're always so damned hard on me, Donna. Harry, I want to get dressed. Please, leave me. Oh, confound you! <laughs> I shall dress carefully tonight. Curl my ringlets round my fingers, place rubies in my ears. For Donna St. Colum, in her cream satin gown, with her ringlets and her jewels, must bear no resemblance to that bedraggled cabin boy of La Mouette, who stood beneath Lord Penrose's window only five days ago. My hands and throat are burnt by the sun. Harry has no imagination, but Rockingham will never believe that this is jaundice, the result of a fever. If this were a hundred years ago, I would be preparing sleeping drafts to put in their wine, or I would have sold myself to the devil and placed them under a spell. But it is not a hundred years ago. It is my own time, and such things do not happen any more. Come in. My lady? I am nearly ready, Prue. If you could help me with my dress. Of course, my lady. But... Oh, dear. What has happened? It's William, my lady. William? Where is he? In my room, my lady. Please, you must come. Wait, I will bring a candle. William! Don't 
touch me, my lady. You'll soil your gown. There is blood on your sleeve. Are you badly hurt? It, it is nothing, my lady. Really. How did it happen? Coming back through the woods, my lady, I saw one of Lord Godolphin's men and he challenged me. I managed to evade him, but received this scratch on my arm. I'll bathe your wound and bind it for you. Come... Let me help you sit up. Oh, there. Prue, bring some water and a towel. Yes, my lady. Shall I do it? No, no, let me. You get the water. Yes, my lady. My lady, you should not do this for me. Lie still. Lie still and rest. At least my mission was successful. I managed to reach La Mouette and saw my master. You told him that Godolphin and Penrose were dining here tonight? Yes, my lady. And he smiled and said, Tell your mistress I am in no way disturbed and that La Mouette has need of a cabin boy. Mm. Here is the water. Sir Harry sends word to your ladyship that he and the gentlemen are awaiting supper. Tell Sir Harry to start. I will be with them directly. Very well, my lady. William, we shall need the key to the wine cellar. Uh, oh, yes. Here it is. Thank you. Tell me, the ship herself, is all well with the ship? Will she sail tonight? My lady. Oh. Oh, oh William. As I cover William with blankets... I scarcely know what I am doing. I leave the room and walk down the stairs into the dining room, where I hear the scraping of chairs on the floor as the guests rise to their feet and wait for me. What are they thinking, I wonder? That this is the famous Lady St. Column, of whom from time to time they hear so much gossip, so much scandal. She, who has given something of herself to every philanderer at St. James's, no doubt, not to mention his majesty himself. Gentlemen! A toast, gentlemen, to the sea and a fair wind. To the sea and a fair wind. Fair wind. And a toast... To the French pirate. I have never looked so beautiful. As I flirt and chatter to those around me, I see nothing. Not the blaze of the candles, nor the long table splendid with silver piled with dishes. Not Godolphin in his plum-coloured coat, nor Penrose in his grey wig, nor Harry blue-eyed and flushed. All I can see is the man who stands on the deck of a ship in a silent creek, saying farewell to me in thought as he waits for the tide. I must keep these men here all night, if necessary, in order to give him time to get away. In part four of Frenchman's Creek by Daphne du Maurier, Donna St. Colum was played by Lorna Heilbronn. William was Michael Tudor Barnes, Harry, Michael Cochrane, Rockingham, Christopher Godwin, and Prue, Elizabeth Mansfield. Frenchman's Creek by Daphne du Maurier was dramatized for radio by Micheline Wando and directed by Cherry Cookson. And in the closing chapters of Frenchman's Creek tomorrow, as Harry and his friends close in on the French pirate, Donna finds her own life in danger when the sleazy Lord Rockingham gets rather too close to the truth for comfort. And there's more Daphne du Maurier tonight. Hello! Hello! Where am I? And 
enter an hour of the seventh dimension. We have liftoff, gentlemen. Hey! For the best sci-fi. Hello, control. Discovery calling. Come in, please. Fantasy. This was reality. I, the alien presence. Original programs. No eyes. The can't survive. No eyes. And classic readings. There was something, and a highly dangerous something, too, down there in the deep. The Seventh Dimension on BBC Seven. So are you with us? 6 p.m. and midnight, seven nights a week. For the first time for many years, there is a banquet in the great dining hall of Navron House. I preside over the company, beautiful and charming. But this is no ordinary banquet. The men here are preparing to catch a French pirate, Jean Benoit Aubry, a daring and adventurous man, and my lover. I am determined to keep the party going until he has time to finish the repairs to his ship and to sail away to safety. Frenchman's Creek by Daphne de Maurier Dramatized in six parts by Micheline Wando With Lorna Heilbronn as Donna St. Colin Struan Roger as Jean Michael Cochran as Harry and Christopher Godwin as Rockingham Part 5, A Midsummer Raid. More wine, Rockingham. Yes, please, Donna. Uh, the fever doesn't seem to have done you much harm, Donna. You look radiant. Oh, don't be misled, Rockingham. Donna is an iceberg. I've not been married to her for close on seven years without discovering that. Harry, dear, you'll have some more wine. Oh, well, my lord. Yes, Come ma'am. on. There. We should have music, like my grandfather used to, up there in the gallery. You know, when the old queen was still alive? Why does nobody have minstrels nowadays? I suppose the confounded Puritans killed them all, eh, Pembroke? I consider that sort of foolery better dead. My father fought for Parliament, you know. Is there much dancing there in the court? Why, yes, Lord Godolphin. You should come to town, you know, when your wife has had her child. A son, eh, Godolphin? We live in hopes, Penrose. Let's drink a toast to your son. Mm. More wine! I saw you returning from your walk this evening, Donna. Did you find it wet in the woods? And how is your wife bearing with the heat, Lord Godolphin? I swear I've seen you before, dear lady, but I cannot for the life of me recollect the time or the place. We probably met when I came here as a bride, Lord Penrose. No, it is an inflection in your voice. I believe I've heard it very recently. Oh, Donna has that effect on every man. They always feel that after seeing her, they have known her before. I gather you speak from experience, Rockingham. <laughs> now, that would be telling. Were you ever in Foy, Lady St. Colin? Never, to my certain knowledge. You've heard how I was robbed? Yes, indeed. So very distressing for you. And you have had no news of your ship? Ah, oh, the Merry Fortune is snug in a French port by now with no legal means of extracting her. However, I hope to settle accounts tonight, once and for all. And you, my Lord Godolphin... Were you also involved in the loss of Lord Penrose's ship? I was, madam. I trust you received no hurt. Uh, luckily, none. Like all Frenchmen, they prefer to run for it rather than face up to an honest fight. Was their leader really the desperate man you have led me to believe? Uh, Twenty times worse, madam. A most impudent, bloodthirsty, evil-looking rogue I've ever clapped eyes on. We have heard since that his ship carried a full complement of women on every voyage. Most of them poor wretches kidnapped from our villages. He had a woman aboard the Merry Fortune. I could see her there on the deck above me, as plain as I see you now. Huh? A bold-faced baggage, if ever there was one, with a cut on her chin and hair all over her eyes. Some harlot from the French docks, no doubt. <laughs> and there was a poor wretched scrap of a boy who came knocking on Penrose's door. I'll take my oath, he had a hand in it. They'd never have slipped away from us but for the wind. You'd say it was the work of the devil himself. George here had the villain covered with his musket, but he missed him. And how was that, my lord? I, I, I was temporarily at a disadvantage, my lord. <laughs> We've heard all about it, never fear, George. You lost your wig, didn't you? <laughs> the rascal of a froggy pinched your wig. <laughs> Take no notice of them, dear Lord Godolphin. Have some more to drink. 
For after all, what is the loss of a wig? It might have been something so much more precious. And what would Lady Godolphin do then? (laughs) (laughs) Gentlemen, we've wasted enough time. Have you all forgotten that we meet tonight on very desperate business? <clears throat> Do you wish me to leave? No, nonsense, nonsense. So don't let my wife stay at her own table, damn me. The party will fall flat without her. Lady St. Column, we could talk more freely if you were not here. But of course, I understand. I would not dream of hindering in any way. Let me just pour you some more wine and then I shall go. Piracy, after all, is the business of men. Well, who the devil's that? Someone two and a half hours late for supper? We expect no one else. This meeting was a secret. Well, go and open the door, someone. But where the devil are all the servants? I'll call them, Harry. <laughs> Hello there. You're asleep, damn you. What's it, Harry? Mm? Someone has blown the candles out. It's as black as pitch out here. Uh-huh. Did you tell your servants to go to bed, Harry? Well, of course not. Give him another call, Rob, can't you? There's not a light anywhere. Oh, God damn it, I'll unbolt the door myself. It must be one of our people come to report. One of the men we posted in the woods. Someone has given us away and the fight's begun. What the devil have been done? Good evening, oh. gentlemen. gentlemen. Please don't get up. I have you all covered. The first man who moves will get a bullet through his brain. Oh. Jean-Benoit Aubery, at your service. I will not keep you long. Oh, you ladyship, I've heard a great deal about you. And about your exquisite jewels, perhaps you would give me your earrings. I have a pendant they will match rather well. If any man's hand strays to his sword, that man will fall. What the devil's going on? Here, my earrings. Thank you, your ladyship. I was told you had had a fever. I trust you are quite recovered. I thought so, but your presence here will doubtless bring it back again. Oh, that would be a pity. My conscience would be uneasy. My cabin boy suffers from fever from time to time, but the sea air does wonders for him. You ought to try it. Ah, Lord Godolphin, I believe. Uh, Last time we met, I relieved you of your wig. This time, perhaps, I might take something a little more substantial. The decoration on your breast, the ribbons and the star. Your weapon also, I regret to say, is something I cannot leave upon your person. Ah, and good evening to you, sir. Lord Penrose, I believe. I must thank you for the gift of the Merry Fortune. You would not recognize her now, I swear. They have given her a new rig on my side of the channel and a coat of paint into the bargain. Your sword, sir, if you please. And what have you in your pockets? You'll pay for this, God damn you! Possibly, but in the meantime, it is you who are paying. Your money, please, in this bag. Now, gentlemen, I wish to return to my ship. To have you join your fellows in the woods and give chase to me would, I fear, somewhat prejudice my plan. So I must ask you to take off your breeches and hand them to my men. Likewise, your stockings and your shoes. Have you not made game of us enough? The night is warm, you know, and yesterday was midsummer. Lady St. Coulomb, perhaps you will be good enough to go into the salon. These gentlemen will not care to undress themselves before you in public, however much they may desire to do so in private. Let me hold the door open for you. I will give you five minutes. While you are disrobing her ladyship and I will discuss the affairs of the day. (laughs) Jean, you are mad, quite mad. Here are your earrings back and the necklace. I took it off your neck. Let me put it back. Come. Oh, your skin is so soft. Oh, I have not kissed you for nearly 24 hours, Donna. Oh. Mm. How did you get into the house? Uh, that cut William received from the fellow in the woods on his way back did not help. But he managed to open the door to us just as we planned. Oh, your servants, by the way, are all shut up in your game larder, tied back to back like the fellows we found on the Merry Fortune. Donna. Yes? La Mouette will sail within two hours if all goes well. I have no cabin boy. Do you know of a likely lad who would sail with me? I do. 
You remember how we talked on the ship? Yes. And we agreed that it was impossible for a woman to escape except for an hour and a day? Yes. This morning, when William brought me the news that you were no longer alone, I realized that our make-believe was over. From now on, Lamouette must sail other waters and find different hiding places. And although she will be free, and the men on board her free, her master will remain captive. What do you mean? I mean that I am bound to you, even as you are bound to me. From the very first, I knew that it would be so. When I came here in the winter and I lay upstairs in your room, my hands behind my head and looked at your solemn portrait on the wall, I smiled to myself and said, she and no other. And I waited and I did nothing, for I knew that our time would come. I guess that somewhere in heaven knew what country there was someone who was a part of my body and my brain. And that without him I was lost, like a straw blown by the wind. But it's too late. There is nothing we can do. All day, as I worked on the ship, I thought and thought. And? You must decide, Donna, what you want to do. If we return safely to the ship through this cordon in the wood and hoist sail without delay and leave with the tide, we shall be down the coast by sunrise. If you want to come with me, William will take you to the bay. Oh, sure. I can't ask you to leave your children and come with me. Only you can decide that. I have loved you, Donna, in almost every mood. But mostly, I, I think, when you threw yourself down on the deck of the Merry Fortune in your cabin boy's breeches with blood on your face and the rain streaming down your torn shirt, <laughs> And I looked at you and laughed, and a bullet whistled over your head. Oh. I must go, my darling Donna. Here, take your earrings and the bracelet. If you come to the bay, I will put off in a boat to have your answer. Remember, sunrise. A draft comes from the open window. I close and bolt it and go to the dining room. There are the plates, the dishes, the bowls piled high with fruit, the silver goblets and the glasses. The chairs are pushed back as though the guests have just risen from supper and withdrawn. There is a strange forlorn air about the table, like a still life picture drawn by an amateur hand in which the food, the fruit, and the spilled wine lack life and reality. Well, my dear Donna, I see that your jewels have been returned to you. Rockingham, there's blood on your shirt. What has happened? What did you give in place of your jewels? You are very serious, Rockingham. I should have thought this evening's jest would have amused you well. You are right. It has amused me. That we could be disarmed and unbreached in so short a time by so few jesters is a royal prank. But that Donna St. Colum should look upon the leader of the jesters in the way she did, that I did not find amusing. I do not know what you mean, Rockingham. I now understand much that has been puzzling me. That servant of yours, William, a spy, of course, of the Frenchman's. Those walks of yours in the woods, that elusive look in your eye. Tonight I saw the man for whom that look was meant. Well, do you deny it? I deny nothing. Not a very pleasant ending for Donna St. Colum. You have never been inside a jail, have you? And a feeling of a rope around your neck as it tightens and chokes you? 
How would you like that, Donna? All this because my Lord Rockingham fancies I smiled upon a pirate when he asked me for my jewels. Tell your story to Godolphin, to Penrose, to Harry even. They will say you are mad. Supposing your Frenchman was caught and bound and brought before you, and we played with him a little, as they played with prisoners some hundred years ago, Donna, with you for an audience. <sighs> I rather think that you would give yourself away. We no longer burn our heretics at the stake. But our pirates are hanged, drawn and quartered. And their accomplices suffer the same fate. Very well. Wake Harry from his drunken snoring. Fetch horses, fetch soldiers and weapons. And then when you have caught your pirate, you may hang us both side by side from the same tree. Ah, you would not mind dying now because you have had at last the thing you wanted all your life. Is that not true? Yes, it is true, Rockingham. And it might have been me. Never! That I swear, never in this world. If you had not left London, if you had not come down here to Navarone, it would have been me. Yes, though it were from boredom, idleness, from indifference, even from disgust, it would have been me. No, Rockingham, never! You bitch! Oh, what are you doing? I believe that I am going to kill you. <laughs> Keep away from me! He holds his knife high above his shoulder. He throws it straight at my throat. It strikes the ruby pendant on my neck, cracking it in two. I feel the cold steel slip away from me, pricking my skin, catching itself in the folds of my gown. Now I have you. I fall against the table. Somewhere beneath me is the knife. Get away, you stupid animals! My right hand finds the knife and closes upon it. I grip its cold hasp and I drive it upwards under his armpit. His soft flesh heals to the blade. Surprisingly easy, surprisingly warm, the blood running thick and fast to my hand. I can see a glimmer of pale light from the window in the gallery. I climb the stairs. Rockingham follows me on all fours like a dog. James! My son, James! At last I know anger. I am resolute, cold. A shield hangs on the wall, some trophy of a dead St. Colin. I tear it from its place, heavy and dusty with age. The weight of it drags me to my knees. Still, Rockingham comes towards me. As he turns the corner of the stair, I hurl the shield at him, driving it full in his face. I want to lie down in the darkness, to sleep with my face between my hands. I want to dream of the coast of Brittany, golden as sunrise, the rocks about it jagged and crimson like the coast of Devon, the white breakers hurling themselves upon the sand, the spray throwing a fine mist onto the cliffs, the smell of it mingling with the warm earth and the grass. I want to forget the guttering candles in the dining hall, the smashed glass, the broken chairs, Rockingham's face when the knife touched his flesh. Are you all right? Donna? Are you better? Harry, what has happened? Where am I? Rock's dead. The best friend I've ever had. He saved your life, you know. He he must have fought that devil single-handed, alone there in the darkness. Oh. Ah. oh, my poor beautiful, my poor sweet. What is the time? Nearly noon, I believe. You've been asleep. I've been sleeping here all morning until noon. Try and forget the confounded... God damn night, it's all my fault. I, I'll never drink again, I swear it. I, I I, ought to have stopped it all. But you shall have your revenge, I promise you that. 
We've caught him, you know. Caught whom? Why, the Frenchman, of course. The devil who killed Rock and would have killed you too. The ship's gone and the rest of his crew, but we've got him, the leader, the damn pirate. So, you needn't worry any more. He didn't molest you in any way, did he, Donna? No, Harry. He did nothing to offend me. I'll sell the land and house and we'll, we'll go and live in Hampshire. I'll live the life of a country gentleman and I'll teach young James to ride and to hawk. How would you like that, eh? I don't know, Harry. What happened here? You were with him, weren't you, in the salon? He gave me back my jewels and then he went. He must have come back and tried to follow you upstairs. You fainted in the passage by your room. I, I don't understand. Was he wounded? God bless me, no. He'll hang without a scratch on him. He and three other scoundrels made for a point below Helford to join their vessel in mid-river. When Penrose got down there, the fellows were swimming out to the ship, and their leader was on the beach, cool as a blade of steel, fighting two of our people at once while his men got away. The ship sailed out of Helford with a roaring tide under her and a fair wind on her quarter. The Frenchman watched her go, and God damn it, he was laughing, Penrose said. Where have they taken him? George Godolphin has him in the keep, strongly guarded, and therefore moving him up to Exeter or Bristol. What then? Why, they'll hang him, Donna, unless George Godolphin and Penrose and the others save His Majesty's subjects the trouble of doing so and hang him on Saturday midday as a... As a treat to the people. Would that be within the law? No, but I don't think His Majesty would trouble us for a reason. I see. I am very tired now, Harry. Oh, I want to see you well. That's all I care about, damn it. To see you well and happy. We'll go to Hampshire then, shall we? Yes, Harry. We'll go to Hampshire. I must go and see Godolphin. I must persuade him to let me visit his prisoner. Jean has saved his ship, and he has saved his crew. Now, wherever he is, he will be thinking calmly, planning some method of escape for himself. If he can face his enemies in this way, then I must not be afraid of what I have to do. Come in. Prue, whatever is the matter? Oh, I've done something very wicked. Last night, when there was all that terrible to do, and poor Lord Rockingham was killed, I hid William in the nursery. He told me that Sir Harry and the other gentlemen would kill him if he was found, that the French pirate was his master. And instead of giving him up, my lady, I made him a bed on the floor beside the children. And after breakfast, when the gentlemen were all away searching for him, I let him out, my lady, by the side door. And no one knows anything about it but you and me. It's all right, Prue. You are a good and faithful girl to tell me this. Where is William now? He asked for you. And I told him you were in bed, very shocked and exhausted, because Lord Rockingham had been killed that night. At that, he seemed to think for a while, and, and then... He, he said he had friends who would shelter him, and that he would be there if you wished to send word to him. Very well, Prue. Say nothing of this to anyone. Now, I must get up. Prue, whatever happens, go on as you have always done, won't you? Look after the children and love them well. Of course, my lady. Harry, I want you to do something for me. Anything in the world, what is it? 
I want you to leave Navron today and take Prue and the children with you to Hampshire. I shall follow you tomorrow. They'll probably be hanging their fellow tomorrow. You would like to see him hanged, would you not? Well, we could fix it for nine in the morning, perhaps, and then start our journey afterwards. Have you ever seen a man hanged? Oh, yes. There is little to it, I admit, but this is rather different. Damn it, Donna, the fellow murdered poor Rock. I would have killed you, too. You mean to say you have no wish for revenge? Revenge doesn't concern me. Yes, but what will George Godolphin say? I shall explain to him this afternoon after you have gone. Oh, God damn it, Donna, shall I ever understand you? No, Harry, but it does not matter very much. It does matter. It makes life most confounded hell for the both of us. Do you really think that? Oh, damn me, I, I, I don't know what to think. I only know I'd give anything, anything in the world to make you happy. The cursed trouble is I... I don't know how to. I shall be 30 in three weeks' time. Perhaps as I grow older, I shall grow wiser. I don't want you any wiser. I want you as you are. I, I believe you've still got that damn fever on you. No, I have no fever. Your eyes, your eyes are strange. Your expression has changed. Oh, God damn it, I don't know what it is. I told you I'm getting older. It's my age you can see in my eyes. Ah, oh, well. I suppose I'm a fool and a blockhead. I will have to spend the rest of my days wondering what the hell has happened to you. I rather think you will, Harry. Suddenly, all is noise and confusion. Henrietta and James are like puppies, delighted to be going on a journey. They don't mind leaving Navron. In a month's time, they will be playing in the Hampshire fields and Cornwall will be forgotten. I wave and blow kisses until the carriage turns the corner and I can see the children no more. Now that everyone has left, I walk into the garden. The house already has a strange, deserted appearance, as though it knows that soon the shutters will be drawn, the doors bolted. No sunshine, no voices, no laughter. Here beneath this tree, Lord Godolphin called upon me for the first time, surprising me with my ringlets in disorder and flowers behind my ears. There were bluebells in the woods, and the bracken was young. Now it is waist-high and dark green. So much loveliness swiftly come and swiftly gone. This is the last time I shall look upon it all, for I shall never come to Navron again. Part of me will linger here forever, a footstep running tiptoe to the creek, the touch of my hand on a tree, the imprint of my body in the long grass. Perhaps one day, in after years, someone will wander there and listen to the silence as I have done and catch the whisper of the dreams that I dreamt here in midsummer under the hot sun and the white sky. But now, now I have work to do. A rescue plan. Stable boy, saddle a horse for me. I am going riding. In part five of Frenchman's Creek by Daphne du Maurier, Donis and Colum was played by Lorna Heilbronn and Jean by Struan Roger. Rockingham was Christopher Godwin. Harry, Michael Cochran. Lord Penrose, Christopher Good. Lord Godolphin, Norman Bird. And Prue, Elizabeth Mansfield. Frenchman's Creek by Daphne de Maurier was dramatized for radio by Micheline Wandor and directed by Cherry Cookson. Will 
William, open the door. This is Lady St. Column from Navron. My lady, thank God. I thought I should find you here. Come into the kitchen, quickly. How is your arm? Oh, it is much better. Just a little weak. Uh, please, sit down. Prue gave me your message. My lady, what can I say to you? I would have died for you that night, and instead I lay like a sick child on the floor of the nursery. You could not help it. You were wounded. But I have not come to talk about that. What then? I sent Sir Harry, Prue and the children away from Navron today. You know what has happened. I know, my lady, that the ship was lucky enough to escape with the crew safe aboard, but that my master lies a prisoner in the care of Lord Godolphin. Time is short, William, for his lordship and the others may take the law into their own hands. We have only a few hours. Listen to me, William. This pistol is for Jean. When I leave you now, I shall proceed to his lordship's and gain admittance to the keep. It should not prove difficult, for his lordship is a fool. But that is dangerous and foolhardy, my lady. I have a plan, William. We shall need horses. Um, that should not prove impossible. Good. I shall return here after my visit to Lord Godolphin and tell you what has been arranged. Very well, my lady. In three days' time or less, perhaps, you will see the cliffs of Brittany again. You will be home, William. <laughs> There is the grey outline of Godolphin's house. The squat tower and strong walls of the keep. One narrow slit in the tower, midway between the battlement and the ground. As I pass beneath it, my heart beats strongly. That must be my Frenchman's prison. Perhaps he can hear the sound of my horse. Perhaps he can even see me. you, madam. Tell Lord Godolphin that Lady St. Column has come to visit him. Very well, madam. What is happening in the park? They are preparing the gallows for the Frenchman, madam. Hurry and tell your master I am here. Certainly, madam. My very humble apologies, madam. I fear I've kept you waiting. My wife is in labour. The physician is with her ladyship now. He seems to think nothing is likely to occur until late evening. My dear Lord Godolphin, you must forgive me. Had I known, I would never have disturbed you. But I bring apologies from Harry. Unfortunately, he has had to return to London. Harry left for town? But it was all arranged. Half the countryside will be gathered here tomorrow. Harry was most insistent that he must see the Frenchman hanged. He asked most humbly for your forgiveness, but the matter was really pressing. His Majesty himself, I believe, is concerned about it. Oh, well, naturally, madam, under such circumstances I can understand. But it is a pity, a very great pity. The occasion is so unusual and such a triumph. And it looks as though we may celebrate something else at the same time. Wait until you have been a father a dozen times. Oh, dear, dear, dear. Oh, dear, oh, dear Lord Godolphin, oh. I wish I could distract you. Oh, I am sure your wife is in no danger at all. Ah, is that the keep where the Frenchman is imprisoned? Yes, madam. He spends his time, so his jailers tell me, in drawing birds on a sheet of paper. <laughs> the fellow is mad, of course. Of course. <laughs> Congratulations are pouring in upon me from all over the county. I flatter myself that I've earned them. Mm. It was I, you know, who disarmed the scoundrel. How courageous of you. It is true he gave his sword into my hands, but nevertheless it was to me he gave it. I shall make a great story of it at court, Lord Godolphin. His Majesty will be very impressed with your handling of the whole affair. Oh, you flatter me, madam. <laughs> Harry would agree with me, I know. I wish I had some souvenir of the Frenchman to show His Majesty. Do you think he might give me one of his drawings? I am sure I can procure one for you. I have forgotten so much, heaven be praised, of that fearful night, that I cannot now recollect his appearance, except that he was extremely large and fierce and appallingly ugly. Oh, well, I should not describe him so. 
He's not so large a man as myself. <laughs> and like all Frenchmen, has a sly rather than an ugly face. What a pity I shall not be able to give an accurate description of him to His Majesty. But you will see him hang tomorrow. Alas, no. I go to rejoin Harry and the children. Oh. I... I suppose I could permit you a glimpse of the rascal in his cell. Surely the fellow so terrified you that you could not bear to see him. Today, Lord Godolphin is so different from the other night. I have you to protect me. <laughs> and the Frenchman is unarmed. I would so much like to paint a picture to His Majesty of the notorious pirate, caught and put to death by the most faithful of his Cornish subjects. Then you shall, madam. You shall. <laughs> Oh, but Lucy... The physician I... is with your wife. First babies take their time. Oh, my poor Lucy. If only I could have spared her this ordeal. It will all be over very soon. Mm. Come, shall we go? Who's there? Lord Godolphin, open up. I brought Lady St. Column to glance at our prisoner. He won't be fit for a lady to see this time tomorrow. <laughs> oh, that is why her ladyship has come today. Take us to his cell. Certainly. Jim, keep an eye out. Right old, sir. He is quite secure, I see. Uh, this is the only door, and this is the only stair. Uh, the men below are always on guard. There he sits, just as he did in his cabin on board La Mouette. Wait outside. Yes, my lord. Stand up, prisoner. This is Lady St. Cullum. She is most disappointed that she cannot see you hang tomorrow, and she wishes to take one of your drawings to His Majesty as a souvenir of one of the biggest blackguards that ever troubled his faithful subjects. The Lady St. Colum is very welcome. I can offer her a fair selection. Uh, what is your favourite bird, madame? I am not sure. Sometimes I think it is a nightjar. I regret I cannot offer you a nightjar. You see, when I last heard one, I was so intent upon another occupation that I did not observe the nightjar as clearly as I might have done. You mean you were so intent upon robbing one of my friends of his possessions that you gave no thought to anything else? My lord, I've never before heard the occupation in question so delicately described. I think you have not given this herring gull his full plumage. Oh, the drawing is unfinished, madame. Uh, this seagull dropped one of its feathers in flight. However, they seldom venture far to sea. I mean, this particular gull, for instance, is probably only ten miles from the coast at the present moment. No doubt tonight he will return again to the shore in search of the feather he has lost. <laughs> Your ladyship knows little of ornithology. I've never heard of a seagull picking up feathers. <laughs> I had a feather mattress as a child. I remember the feathers became loose after a while. And one of them fluttered from the window of my bedroom and fell into the garden below. Of course, the window was a large one. Not like the slit that gives light to this cell. No, of course. Did they uh, ever blow under the door? That I can't remember. I think that even a feather would have difficulty in passing beneath the door. Unless, of course, it was given assistance, like a strong breath of air, you know, say, the draught from the barrel of a pistol. Uh -huh. But I must choose my drawing. This sandaling, I, I wonder if this would please His Majesty. My Lord, hmm? do I hear wheels upon the drive? Perhaps the physician is departing. <laughs> he should not leave without consulting me first. Uh, hold there! I lock the door! So many drawings to choose from. I pass the pistol from my riding habit onto the table. Jean covers it with his drawings. I cannot decide between the seagull and the sandaling. Oh, do not wait for me, my lord. A woman can never make up her mind. I will follow you in a minute or two. Well, I must see the physician. If you will excuse me, madam. Guard, remain here with her ladyship. Thank you, my lord. Oh. I hope for your sake that it proves to be a boy, guard. There will be more ale for you. I am not the only cause for excitement. <laughs> By midday, 
and will be dangling from the tree while the rest of us drink to the future, Lord Godolphin. It seems rather hard that neither the prisoner nor myself will be here to drink the health of the son and heir. I know. Suppose we three drink now while his lordship is with the physician. Uh, well, I, uh, oh, thank you, my lady. <laughs> uh, Jim, bring three mugs of ale. If his lordship catches us, there'll be the devil to pay. What is your name? Zachariah Smith, my lady. Very well, Zachariah. If trouble comes of this, I will plead your case with the king himself. Oh, thank you, ladyship. Ah, lady. Well, long life to your ladyship. Full purse. And a good appetite to myself. And to you, sir, a speedy death. Long life to the future Godolphin. And to Lady Godolphin, who is at uh, this moment suffering some discomfort. <laughs> Zachariah Smith, are you a married man? Ah, twice married, and the father of fourteen. Then you know what his lordship is enduring at this moment. However, with so able a physician as Dr. Williams, there will be little cause for anxiety. You know the doctor well, I suppose? I know, my lady. I come from the north coast. I'm not a local man. Dr. Williams is a funny little fellow, with a round, solemn face and a mouth like a button. Ah. I have heard it said that he is as good a judge of ale as any man living. Then it is a great pity that he does not drink with us now. Perhaps he will do so later when his day's work is finished and he is made a father of Lord Godolphin. Which will not be much before midnight. Oh, ah. All nine of my boys were born as the clock struck twelve. When I see Dr. Williams, I will tell him that Zachariah Smith will be pleased to drink a mug of ale with him. Your health, my lady. Zachariah, you will remember this evening for the rest of your life. <sighs> <laughs> if Lord Godolphin has a son, there'll be so much rejoicing on the estate that we may forget to hang you in the morning. Well, I have chosen my drawing. Goodbye, Frenchman. May you slip away tomorrow as easily as the feather did from my mattress. It will depend upon the quantity of ale that my jailer consumes tonight with Dr. Williams. <laughs> You'll have to boast a stout head if he can beat mine. Goodbye, Lady Saint Colomb. Cold blooded, isn't he? For a man about to die. They say these Frenchmen have no feelings. You are a good fellow, Zachariah. I won't forget to tell the physician to call upon you. A little man, remember, with a mouth like a button. And not a word to his lordship. <laughs> The magnolia scent is heavy and sweet. The gold crescent of this new moon high above the dark trees. In the nursery, the beds are stripped, the carpets taken up, the curtains are drawn and the air is already hot and unused. Now, my clothes. Stockings, breeches, patched and coloured shirt. I shall play the boy again and escape from my woman's clothes. A handkerchief to wind round my hair and a leather strap for my waist. Lady Donna St. Colum is asleep and dreaming and the cabin boy is about to wake. How dark the hall is. What if Rockingham's ghost should return, crouching there, his knife in his hand? Stupid. Rockingham is dead. I have nothing to fear, not from him at any rate. William, is that you? I have the horses, my lady. Come. Good heavens, Dr. Williams. You look so smart, and I do believe you are wearing a wig. I feel ridiculous, my lady. You must not forget, my William, that you are a physician and I am a cabin boy. You must drop my lady and call me plain Tom. Oh, my lady, I should be too embarrassed. Good heavens, William. Physicians should never be embarrassed, especially when they have just brought sons and heirs into the world. It's about half a mile. We'll leave the horses under cover of the trees and go on foot to the park gates. Look, 
William, there's a light on the first floor. The sun and air still tarries. That's the physician's carriage. They'll be busy enough. Are you ready? Yes, my lady. Go on, then. Is there one Zachariah within? Who wants him? <clears throat> uh, Dr. Williams from Helston. So, <laughs> her ladyship didn't forget her promise. Come inside, sir. Uh, was it a boy? Uh, oh, uh, it was indeed, my friend. Ah. A fine boy and the image of his lordship. <laughs> I've uh, brought some ale for us. Well, sir, I have fathered fourteen, and I may say I know the business as well as you. <laughs> what was the weight of the child? Um, ah, the weight. Uh, yeah. Now, uh, let me see. Uh, round about four pounds, I should say, uh, though I cannot recollect the exact figure. You, you, you call that a fine boy? <laughs> My curse me, sir, the child would never live. My youngest turned the scale at eleven pound when he was born, and he looked a shrimp at that. Oh, did I say four? A mistake, of course. Now I come to remember it, it was somewhere around uh, fourteen. Fourteen? Uh, Fifteen, or even sixteen God pounds. God save you, sir, but that's something over the odds. Oh, uh, it's a ladyship you should look to, and not the child. <laughs> uh, is she well? Oh, very well, and in excellent spirits. Ah, then she's a pluckier woman than I'd ever give her credit for. Well, sir, it seems to me you deserve another drink. Oh, I warrant they don't brew stuff like that in France. I took some ale just now to my prisoner. You'll scarcely credit me, sir, but he's a cold-blooded fish for a dying man, as you might say. He quaffed his ale in one drop. <laughs> uh, will you have another, doctor? Oh, uh, thank you, my man. <laughs> Uh, <clears throat> I should be very interested to see the prisoner. Ah, uh, oh, it's irregular, sir, of course. Um, uh, but uh, when a man is going to be hanged in the morning, even if he is a Frenchman and a pirate, you can't exactly wish him ill, can you? <laughs> uh, thank you, sir. You're a true gentleman. When my wife is expecting again, I shall think of you. <laughs> Come along. It's just up here. Now then. Is Dr. Williams within? What do you want with him? They sent word from the house. Her ladyship's been taken worse. Open up. I must talk to Dr. Williams. All right, lad. Come in. Come in. Zachariah! They want the doctor up at the house yonder. Hey! What the devil are you doing? Get away from the door. Uh, uh, I am here, Shaw. Are you all right? Yes. Oh, well done. Give me a handkerchief, Donna, for a gag. There you are. He won't move for a while. Have you got him, William? Smith is sleeping like a baby. Open the door, Donna, to see if the road is clear. Hurry! The physician is leaving. By heaven, what a stroke of luck. Shaw, what are you doing? He'll see you. Are you mad? Hurry! Stop! What do you want? Did you give his lordship an air then? There are twin daughters up at the hall, and I'll thank you to take your hands off my carriage window and let me pass. Ah, but you'd give us a ride first, won't you? Move aside, my good man. Yeah. Climb up beside me, Donna. We're riding style. Get inside, William. Yes, and give the doctor a glass of ale if you have any left. By the Lord, he's had a harder time tonight than we have had these last few minutes. Open the park gates! Your master has twin daughters and the physician wants his supper. And that's for me and my cabin boy. We've had enough ale this night to last us for 30 years. We are bound for petition for all I care. It's my last night in the world. I am to be hanged in the morning. Faster! Faster! <laughs> Somewhere back on the road lies a carriage tumbled in a ditch. A horse without bridle or rein grazes behind a hedge. A physician walks along the high road in search of his supper 
Guards lie bound and gagged upon a dungeon floor. It is long past midnight now, darker than it will ever be again. The stars are clustered thick like little pinpricks of light, and the crescent moon has gone. There is no wind, and the sky has the strange clarity and radiance of midsummer. There, the fire is ready, my Donna. Tonight I have no spit and no fish. My cabin boy must be content with burnt bread instead. This is all we have for supper, here. Yeah. And so you fought a man, my Donna, and he died on the floor of Navron House. How did you know? Because I was accused of his murder. Do you remember how upset I was when I caught my first fish? <laughs> I cried when you killed it. But it was different that night. At first I was afraid, then I became angry. What made you angry? It was James. James who woke and cried and suddenly I was no longer afraid. That made me able to throw the shield at Rockingham. I did not mean to kill him. I think that uh, Lady St. Coulomb will never more roister in the streets of London, for she has had her measure of adventure. <laughs> the Lady St. Coulomb will become a gracious matron and smile upon her servants and tenants and the village folk. One day she will have grandchildren about her knee and will tell them the story of the pirate who escaped. And what will happen to the cabin boy? The cabin boy will vigil sometimes in the night and tear his nails and beat his pillow. Then he will fall asleep and dream again. And you? Ah. There is a house in Brittany where once lived a man called Jean Benoit Aubery. He will go back and cover the bare walls from floor to ceiling with pictures of birds and portraits of his cabin boy. As the years go by, the portraits of the cabin boy will become blurred and indistinct. In what part of Brittany does Jean Benoit Aubry have his house? In Finisterre, which means, Donna, the land's end. I can see the rugged cliffs and the scarred face of the headland. I can hear the sea crash against the rocks, the gulls cry. I know how the sun will beat upon the cliffs so that the grass becomes parched and thirsty and dry and how sometimes a soft wind will blow from the west with mist and rain. There is a jagged piece of rock which runs out into the Atlantic. They call it La Pointe du Rard. No trees can live upon it and no blade of grass for it is swept by the west wind. But in the sea beyond the point Two tides meet and surge together, and the surf foams and the spray rises fifty feet into the air. It is chilly. Hold me, Jean. Donna, come with me. Tomorrow you will be on board La Mouette and hold the wheel in your hand and feel the deck under your feet. You can be there too. How can I, Jean? Oh, I wonder how it was that the world first went amiss and people forgot how to live and to love and to be happy. <laughs> we have the river and these hills to ourselves for tonight. Oh. Kiss me, Jean. Oh, oh, my love, my love, my love, my love. When the day came, there was a whiteness and a cold clarity we had never known before. The sky was hard and bright and the sea lay at our feet like a sheet of silver. Look, Donna. La Mouette, 
Her masts crimson, her sails full. La Mouette is returning for her master. I love you, Jean. Donna. Remember me, Jean. Always. The boat is waiting. You must go. You are shivering, Donna. Hurry, please, Jean. Hurry, go! Jean climbed into the waiting fishing boat and hoisted the sail on the single mast. It seemed that this moment was part of another time long ago, when I stood upon a headland and looked out across the sea and saw La Mouette drifting on the horizon like a symbol of escape. I felt as though I had no part in the breaking of the day. I belonged to another age and another world. She was a painted ship on a still white sea. Goodbye, Donna. The shingle was cold on my bare feet and the waves splashed me. Then, out of the sea rose the sun, red like a ball of fire. In the final episode of Frenchman's Creek by Daphne du Maurier, Donna St. Column was played by Lorna Heilbronn and Jean by Struan Roger. William was Michael Tudor Barnes, Lord Godolphin, Norman Bird, and Jim, Vincent Brimble. Smith was played by Michael Kilgariff, and the physician was Joe Dunlop. Technical presentation was by Richard Beadsmore. Assisted by Michael Etherden and Colin Guthrie. Frenchman's Creek by Daphne du Maurier was dramatized for radio by Micheline Wandor and directed by Cherry Cookson. <laughs>